Cordoa. So my name is Jeff Corntassel. Shalagi uh, Yetli Aguenasahi. So I'm from Cherokee Nation, and I've been here on the unceded uh, Lekwungen and uh, Wasanish territory uh, since 2003. And I wanted to um, uh, really welcome you to the event today. We have a, a great speaker lined up, Melina Lavacan Massimo. But just to start us off, I wanted to have uh, Dr. Skip Dick give a few words and, and welcome us to the territory. So, Dr. Skip, turn it over to you. <laughs> The name that was given to me, my, the traditional name given to me by my family, so I know my land and I know my people, and I know where I belong. But anyway, the um, the kind of thing that's happening today is that I want to say first of all that thank you to the to the people, to the university, to allow me to do this because it's it's like I'm um, honoring the old people by carrying on what they had started some time ago when we had the long houses that long houses on the beach along um, the harbor we would welcome communities from all over the, the world they would paddle in from all over first of all we'd look after the security of the community then we make sure that the guests were really looked after by um, feeding them resting them up replenish their supplies so their journey is really well looked after but in contemporary times um it's it's a kind of like um we're carrying out the old ways by making sure the guests that land that end up here with us that are first of all welcomed and looked after for for their own journey and I, I'm so glad that they've chosen the, the institution that they're going to, because um, they have their replenishment of education in, in for them. And I, I just want to say and make sure that all of the guests that are coming to our 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 TV. <laughs> or make sure that they are really feeling that um, that sense of welcome because uh, maybe not even more, not even that but that sense of belonging because it's it's, it's something i really want to say in appreciation for for the education communities that are really making making a difference in our community where the people used to be our people used to drag our students to work. Now our young people are running to running to school. So there's kudos to all the um, instructors, the professionals that are that made make a difference in in uh, instilling the initiative back in in our young people. With that, and on, on, um, on behalf of our the Kwangan people and Saanich and Squamish people. Welcome to our territory, Aichka. Have a good day. Aichka Skip, thank you so much for your good words and for starting us off in, in such a uh, powerful way, thinking about belonging and, and uh, coming to this territory and being welcomed. So thank you. I always learn so much when I hear from you. So Aichka, Aichka Sam, for your good words. Well, we're, Really excited today about our talk and um, a lot of different sponsors help make today possible. So I'll just read out uh, some of the sponsors and then I'll read out the short version of Molina's bio. If I read out the longer version, it would take about 10 minutes. So, uh, so the sponsors today, uh, Center for Indigenous Research and Community-Led Engagement or CIRCLE, uh, Indigenous Studies, uh, Indigenous Governance, and then the Climate and Sustainable Action Plan Leadership Team as part of the uh, Vice President uh, Research uh, Office. And I'm really pleased to, to uh, introduce our guest. Um, Lena Labukan Massimo is Lubukan Cree from Northern Alberta. Uh, she's the founder of Sacred Earth Solar and co-founder of the Healing Justice Director and Indigenous Climate Action. Uh, she is the inaugural fellow at the David Suzuki Foundation where she, her research focused on climate change, indigenous knowledge, 
and renewable energy. She's also a host of a new TV series called Power to the People, and I think we're going to see a short clip from that uh, today, which profiles renewable energy in indigenous communities across the country. Uh, Melina holds a master's degree in indigenous governance at the University of Victoria with a focus on renewable energy. As part of her master's thesis, which I was uh, proud to take part in with her, um, she implemented a, a 20.8 kilowatt solar project in her home community of Little Buffalo, which powers the health center in right in the heart of the, the tar sands. So please help me uh, welcome uh, Melina Labakan Massimo, uh, who's giving a talk today on indigenous perspectives and approaches to climate action. So, uh, Wado, thank you, Melina, for being here today. Hi, hi. Thank you so much, Jeff, for welcoming me today. And hi, hi. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Skip Dick, for welcoming us all. I am a visitor here in Lekwungen territory, and I do not take that lightly. And I'm so honored um, that Dr. Skip would take the time to come onto this TV call, as he said, and um, to join us and to, um, to welcome us in their unceded territory. Um, I am going to show a quick PowerPoint. Well, it's not a quick one. Um, it's a PowerPoint and then a video and then some more PowerPoint. But I'm going to bring it up because I love, um, I come from an oral tradition um, from my my Nihiao side. Um, so, Tansiwakia, Nio Molina, Mio Wapin, Labokan, Masmo, Nia Nihiao, Kineskunta, Nawao. Again, it's an honor and privilege to be here today to share with you all. I've been working on climate justice issues for about um, 15 and social justice issue years, um, social justice issues for about 20 years. So it's been a long time coming. So I have a longer PowerPoint presentation. So please stick with me. I like showing it through pictures because I, again, like I was saying, I, was, I come from an oral tradition where my my nipapa, my, my dad um, was, I'll show you a picture of him actually. Um, that he comes from, we come from an oral tradition. So I would love to st tell story through photos. So I'm gonna switch it over here to the PowerPoint. Give me one second here. And please tell me if there's any issue with it, but um, so thank you. Um, indigenous perspectives and approaches to climate action. Um, again, like Jeff said, I am one of the founders of Indigenous Climate Action. Um, it's an organization we started in 2015 alongside um, Sacred Earth Solar, which I started as well in 2015. And I'll, I'll talk about one of the projects that um, galvanized that, which was based off of my master's thesis research at iGov and at UVic. Um, again, oops, that went all crazy, but um, Melina and um, here ICA and Sacred Earth. So I love to ground myself in where I come from. Like Dr. Skip said, he knows where he's from, he knows, you know, the land that he belongs to, as do I, where I was born in Little Buffalo. Um, my community is a small reserve in Treaty 8 territory um, in Northern Alberta. So if you have ever been to Calgary, it's about eight hours north of there. Um, so we are in the Boreal, which is the northern lungs of Mother Earth, um, which is why I've worked on climate and environmental justice for 15 years to protect our homelands and also protect and work in solidarity with other Indigenous peoples uh, across Turtle Island. Um, so that's my cookum, my grandmother, um, Josephine Lobokan, um, before she passed. And that's actually my dad in the, nor in the, in the north, in the, in the top and his name is Billy Joe, and he was a small child and actually hidden from residential school to the age of nine, turning 10. Um, my Kokum and Musum, because he was the youngest, they realized how um, detrimental these schools were to all the young people, all my aunts and uncles that were going there, um, and how they were coming home very traumatized. So they hid my dad until he could go to a residential day school, which was not much better, but at least um, he could sleep at home at nighttime. And so that was him um, being actually hit in the bush, as we call it, um, with my Muslim on the trap line. Um, every time the Indian agents would come to the community to take all the children, my dad would be taken out um, and hidden um, for the first decade of his life. Uh, so um, just to talk about climate change impacts and, you know, and a lot of the impacts of why Indigenous peoples like myself, you know, a lot of times don't even live at home because the impacts are so severe and um, I have a lot of health issues from living at home. Um, but I, so we have one of the largest inland delta river systems, um, the Mackenzie River Basin. And so we are dealing with, and, this, and the reason why I talk about this today is actually because it's actually connected to the UVic impacts as well of... UVic um, 
on, on the West Coast and extractivism and, and divestment, which I'll talk about later um, in the presentation, but also the, the impacts of climate change that we're feeling out here in so-called British Columbia. Um, but also because we are in, in our homelands, we are one of the largest GHG emitters in the country because of the Alberta tar sands, but also the tankers that will come to the coast and that do come to the coast that is coming from our homelands, from the oil and gas fracking and logging so that's the type of extractivism that I come from and we are you know feeling the impacts already as you can see with the water and the glacier fed systems where a lot of these oil and gas companies are taking pristine fresh glacier fed um, beautiful clean water um, and, and contaminating it and putting it back into um, our river systems where a lot of our peoples are getting quite ill and have elevated rates of cancers um, in the northern boreal which is the northern lungs of mother earth as i said which actually helps us abate climate change by not having deforestation and by 2014 canada actually was number one in the world from deforestation because of these types of um, extractivism and contributing to climate change and we have animals out in our homelands as well that we have locally extinct or local extirpation by 2040 um, woodland caribou will be locally extinct so um, I won't talk about this very long but we do have oil oil um, spill impacts and myself was a, a first responder going to an oil spill in our traditional homelands this was in 2011 um, you can watch more story on oil on Lubicon land it's on a YouTube it's a YouTube video you can watch more where, a lot of, where these photos are taken from um, but the reason why I talk about this is you know um, how UVic as well can lend its support to frontline indigenous land defenders instead of allowing them to be criminalized by the state um, we need to support um, frontline land defenders of like what's happening with Soatin and what's happening in Sequetmic territory um, all the way out here to the coast with the Trans Mountain Pipeline because ultimately it's about the children that are being impacted again um, my child like my um, cousin's children um, you know we were breathing contaminated air we couldn't breathe our eyes were burning our stomachs were turning when the oil spill happened back home it was a very traumatic experience to experience a massive spill beside where my family lived in the reserve that I was born and I would not wish it on my worst enemy and would not wish it on any other indigenous community um, because the community was not um, evacuated like they should have been and, and faced immense impact um, to the health of, of the community as well as the air and the water quality and then also disturbance to the land and basically land that will never be the same again because it was a muskeg which is a part of where our medicines grow peatland moss as you would call it in, in english and it was had immense impact um so the reason why i put this slide here is because you know it's not a what happens to us in our small community is a microcosm of the macrocosm that is happening to so many indigenous communities across turtle island as well as non-indigenous communities you know in these refinery areas um, so this is, this is, you know, what Canada is a part of, of the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions and why, you know, repeatedly when um, they return home from the cops um, are not uh, adequately addressing the climate change in the ways in which we think that we should be when, you know, considering the crisis that we are currently in. So that brings me to the next question of, are we in an era of reconciliation? Um, are we, um, you know, we need to see more, we need to see actions more than words, and that's what I would hope that would come out of a UVic climate plan. Um, but, you know, unfortunately what we're seeing here um, in Canada is that we have, you know, overconsumption um, patterns of, of the Canadian, of, you know, the average Canadian is living in, in the place of where we have, you know, the the world's wealthiest and we are living in the most unsustainable ways. Um, so that means, you know, this creates inequity globally as well as nationally. And so you can read this report. Um, it's the 1.5 degrees lifestyles report that talks about how unsustainable Canadian lifestyles are across the board um, and the highest in the world. Um, so, you know, we are living in an era of neocolonialism, you know, a state of crisis and economic hostages for indigenous peoples across the board. And colonialism has not ended, as we know. And, you know, like I said, I am the most familiar with the resource extraction that's been happening back home. Um, as we have seen here, sorry, I'm just trying to read the actual thing, but it's not letting me because of this, of this um, 
Ah, it's not letting me. Okay. So Kyle, he's a Potawatomi, Kyle White, a Potawatomi scholar, explains that colonialism often pays the way for the expansion of capitalism. Inheritant capitalism is the assimilation, um, dispossession, re removal, depopulation, and erasure of indigenous peoples. Um, so I think this is nothing new to probably the, the audience that I'm speaking to, but, you know, showing that inextricably tied to colonialism and capitalism has laid the groundwork for carbon intensive economics. And this was actually taken, a quote taken out of, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about, about indigenous climate actions decolonizing climate policy. So, you know, the question around, are we, are we, do we actually have protection rights, protected rights as indigenous peoples in section 35 of the Canadian constitution? Um, you know, I like to sometimes say that I don't, it does not feel protected as what we see are happening to the criminalizations of Indigenous peoples when they are trying to protect their homelands. So what we are seeing, you know, in many of our communities is cultural and environmental genocide, further encroachment and contamination and destruction of our territories, resulting in a loss of culture, tradition and, and customs. And this is, these are photos that we took back home. So these are all photos, you know, of the ways in which we like to um, interact with our homelands and the ways in which the, the landscapes are being replaced by industrialized landscapes, drained and polluted watersheds and contaminated air. And these are taken from our homelands, the bottom two taken from, from my homeland. And I do need to make this point here, violence against the earth begets violence against women. Um, and this is an important point to make. Um, you know, even within the University of Victoria context, um, because we want to ensure that we see less violence against women and less violence against the land. Um, and it's no coincidence that the land, that our women are dying, just like um, that the land is dying. And so we have to really think hard about this, about how we can change these ways and the impacts that are happening on the, on the land and to our women. So another question that I have, um, is what does a just transition look like? You know, we are at a point in time where I think a lot of Indigenous peoples know this, that it, we need a critical paradigm shift of how humans as a species are interacting with Mother Earth, with the host um, and the beautiful host that she is. Indigenous peoples have always had an intimate and re reciprocal relationship with Mother Earth, and you know, that's why we see this sacred Earth, um, sacred responsibility to protect her, because in our worldview, and I don't want to say pan-Indigenous, but many Indigenous peoples that I've talked to around the world is that they see that all life is sacred. You know, so we had had indigenous governance structures and, you know, collective care structures in place. Um, we've always functioned as collectives, which is very different than the mainstream individualistic society that we live in. Um, and we also, you know, and I'll talk a little bit more about collective healing accountability um, in, in the last part of the presentation. You know, but I like this thing where, you know, re returning to zero waste communities, indigenous peoples have always been zero waste communities. Um, you know, there's a lot of these new catch words, but I think indigenous peoples have been living those values um, with what, you know, science is now catching up to. And we do have our own indigenous science as well. Um, Community-based solar, for me, just transition, what we did back home, um, which was based off of my master's thesis research um, a number of years ago was, actually just figuring out how to bring um, energy sovereignty to our community. Little Buffalo um, is the reserve, like I said, that I was born into. And this is Carlton, who was 21 at the time. Um, first time ever seeing solar panels. First time my community had ever seen solar panels. First time I had ever seen solar panels in the north. Um, this was about six years ago. And we trained uh, young indigenous young people from the community to build the solar project with us. It's a 20.8 kilowatt system. And so we were building it right beside this community school. Um, we did a top of pole mount system, so 80 panels. Um, the school is just behind, and it's connected to the right with uh, the health center. And it was the first time, you know, young people from kindergarten to grade 12 would see solar panels and, you know, learn about what solar panels do, how they function, how they're different than, um, you know, the extractivism that's happening all around us. Um, we did a solar feast and a solar launch and um, put, you know, we're able to have the little imprints of the, the kindergartens to grade 12 to, so they, they remember the day that, you know, we had solar brought to our community and we had a ribbon cutting ceremony and now all of that grass is grown back over in that area. Um, 
And that's when that was the inception of Sacred or Solar, which is, you know, an attempt for Indigenous peoples to transition away from fossil fuels. And so we started solarizing Squetmeg with the Tiny House Warriors. We've solarized um, in Ferry Creek. We've solarized in um, Wet'suwet'en territory. We've also solarized out east in on Ontario with um, Christy Belcourt and Isaac Murdoch in their language and cultural revitalization camp. And so, you know, what is really important um, that I think is so important and, you know, um, I think people come to UVic and, and then start learning about climate literacy, but we need to learn about climate literacy from a very, very young age. And so that was the point of doing climate literacy workshops in community. Um, and I think that's so important for all of us to, you know, when how we go back into our communities and teach the things that we have learned. Um, this is a the part where I want to show a little bit about um, power to the people. And so this was a a three-year project that I worked on um, that is a TV show that's now air, being broadcasted across the country. Um, it's called Power to the People, and it, we went to 26 locations from coast to coast to profile and uplift the stories of Indigenous peoples that are literally leading the way towards um, you know, just transition, energy sovereignty, food security, eco-housing. Um, so we studied, we, we um, went and interviewed mul a multitude of Indigenous leaders um, about the projects that they were implementing in their communities. And I'm going to show uh, a snippet here um, because we, there are so many. You can go to the website PowerToThePeople.tv and you can see, read about many communities across the board that are implementing. We won't show the one from Gull Bay today, our Six Nations, or Bella Coola or Tolokuit. Um, today we are going to show the Kanaka Bar. Um, one that I think is very fitting with um, kind of all the fires, which is right beside Linton and all the fires that have been happening as well as, you know, then the subsequent flooding. So I'm going to ask Hector to pull that video up now and I'll switch out. I'll stop share for now. And um, if I can learn how to stop share, I'm very new to using Keynote instead of um, PowerPoint. Our prophecies teach us of a time to come when the earth will be ravaged and mankind cease to exist. Now, the gifts of Mother Earth must bring power to the people and lead us on a path to a post-carbon future. Summer in BC's Fraser River Canyon, the hottest place in Canada. For countless generations, this territory has sustained the people of Kanakabar, but now climate change is clouding the future. I've come to see why this community is earning national praise for their efforts to achieve energy and food independence. Hey, hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Eric Shimalan. I'm Serena. I'm Alina. Overall, our goal is to have bees, chickens, and gardens in everyone's backyard. We want to be really self-sufficient here. So before we go to in depth on what we have going on outside, I'd love for you to come inside and meet our chief. He's my father. Okay, let's do it. Hi, how's it going? We brought somebody to meet you guys. Hi there. I'm Eric. Hi, I'm Melina. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. So welcome uh, to Kananka Bar. My name is Chief Patrick Michelle with Kananka Bar New Band, and welcome to Reflecting at the Crossing Place. For 8,000 years, the indigenous populations lived here, and we still live here today. For those people who want to see it, the adverse effects of using the land and resources as we have been doing is now evident. We are experiencing drought, we're experiencing forest fires, we're experiencing heat, flooding, you name it, it's happening. Kanaka Bar's daily temperature used to be about 33, it is now hitting about 35. We are hotter than we ever used to be. Lifting which is 18 kilometers to north of me. When I leave here to go to town and it's 35, Lytton is hitting 41 degrees Celsius. This summer, twice we've hit 49. Kanaka Bar is living in the age of consequences, which is the logical end result of 150 years of extractive exploitive economies. And we all are collectively in the same boat. By becoming aware of the adverse effects of colonization, Kanaka Bar can start getting ready for this environment and economy of tomorrow. Bees is one of our first things that we had going. Joey's for these? Um, no, actually, these bees are really friendly. Amazing. 
right now they're um, filling it up with honey and making sure that they're getting ready for the winter time. So how many chickens do you have? We have 50, I believe. We started out with six and we realized, um, you know, this is working. We can keep on growing and become a larger scale. So you have a student youth program. Can you tell me more about it and how many students that are currently in it? There's six, six students here. That's so great. So coming around the chickens here, hello ladies, we walk into our food forest. Wow. Hector, you can actually mute because otherwise your the volume goes off. So then we can't hear. Up here. Yeah, absolutely. So this is echinacea. There's lots and lots of stuff. A large, large variety of plants. I'm going to say over 90 plants. You can really see the diversity here. The overall plan is that this food is a food forest and not necessarily a garden. So we don't have to have a lot of membership coming in, weeding, fertilizing. The general plan for this is to see, you know, what we can grow here and what's suitable to, you know, grow on a larger scale. The main things are these strawberries that are going to remain growing here. Coming over here, you see these guys working hard. It's our first adventure into creating a greenhouse. What we're creating here is called a solar thermal greenhouse. It's important that we use the solar thermal greenhouse because the extremities of the weather changes. So in the winter time, it can get up to like minus 30, while in the summertime, it can get beyond like 45 degrees Celsius. This is amazing. All in like one little plot of land. I'm so inspired by just the diversity of what you have here. Not even to mention, we have, we have solar in the background here. We have we talked about it, so I want to hear more about that when we get a chance. Yeah, I'll tell you all about it later. There's so much going on here. So what are you guys working on? So we brought in Aaron Coelho at uh, help us do a site-specific climate change impact assessment. So Aaron's report looks at the weather patterns and climates over the last 40 years, talks about where we're at today, but then extrapolates into the future, what is coming. With Aaron here, why don't you guys head on down to one of the gauging stations and Aaron and some of the summer students can take you through that process. So our vulnerability assessment really took a holistic approach, focusing on the water, involving communities, and ultimately coming up with where is Bar most vulnerable now, most vulnerable in the future, and what are the steps they can take to mitigate those vulnerabilities. So you're taking samples right now in the case? Certainly, yeah. We actually have a permanent data logger down in the creek that's recording every 15 minutes. And so we can use that data over time to see if there's any trends and changes in the base flow. So with what you're doing right now, with the data that you're tracking is basically making future projections of how the water, if it will be there or not. It's also really important for us to understand how much water we're um, consuming and using over time to know if we can afford, you know, more projects down the road using the same water. Well, should you go check it out then? Yeah, sure. Come on down. Awesome. Thank you. This is the gauging station. Inside this tube, we have a water level logger. So you guys have been down here and seen this before. And eventually, you guys will be taking care of this because this will be long term. The youth are essential to Pinacabar's vision. They're essential to their ability to adapt to climate change because some of the projections we have are actually for 60, 80 years in the future. Our data logger is inside this pipe. And here it is. And now we can put this back so it can continue measuring data in the creek. So now that we have our data, we can bring this back to the computer and have a look at our water level. Let's take that data back to the office. Okay. One of the challenges our community faces with the heat and drought is wildfire risk. By taking down the dead, diseased, and dying and thinning the trees, we've created a scenario where we'll have a ground fire versus forest fire. But just a little further down, you will see how brushy and dense it is. That would cause a raging forest fire that was indefensible and cause risk to life. 8,000 years, my ancestors lived off the wild salmon resource. It provided everything you needed. It, was, it created our language, our culture, our history, our, our governance structure. What defines Kanaka Bar and the Intercap Nation is the salmon. And here's Gilbert. Oh, just got a fish. Wow, we got another one. Sockeye salmon, their spawning temperature is 18 degrees Celsius. It is the first week in August, and the Fraser River is already in excess. 
at 20 degrees Celsius. The only thing I can think of is everybody needs to stay off the run to keep the run alive. But it's really hard to stop commercial fishermen and the sports fishermen and the indigenous people. It's a lot of salmon that are in this river then. Yeah, every year we see the run size is diminishing. We're exerting more effort to catch less fish. Everything that defines me as an Inca person is dependent on this resource. And this resource is starting to dwindle. If, if the people of the salmon don't have a salmon, then who are we? The people of the salmon may have to become the people of the potato. So what you see down at Kanaka Bar with the chickens and the honey, each home is gonna be able to produce the food that it needs. I think what's really special and unique to this community is that they're actually planning for the future. They're planning for the reality of it and for the changes that are coming. To see how climate change will impact our future, I've come to Canada's leading climate research center. Hey. Hi, Melina. Hey, nice to see you. Welcome to the Richardson College for the Environment and home of the Prairie Climate Center. Thanks for having me. It's a really nice looking building. This is actually an old roller skating rink. Really? And if you look at the walls, that's actually reclaimed boards from the actual floor of the old roller skating rink. And so this is a lead gold building, and it's one of the most energy efficient buildings in Winnipeg. So this is the Prairie Climate Center at the University of Winnipeg. Hey. Laura Cameron here. He's a master's yes. Hi, good to see you again. Hillary Beattie. Hey. Hello. Dr. Steve McCullough. I hear you're like an avid coder. We're a lot of hats. So this is the Climate Atlas of Canada at climateatlas.ca. And this is a portal that tells the story of how climate change is going to impact Canada. The goal of the Climate Atlas is really to engage Canadians in a conversation about climate change. And so for over a decade, we've been interviewing people across Canada about their experiences. Northern Manitoba, we're here in Winnipeg right now. We've got stories about winter roads. And this guy literally starts his interview saying, I'm no environmentalist, but I've been riding on these ice roads for decades and I can see the changes. It's risky business when you're roading. If the winters get warmer, which they appear to be doing, it's, it's going to become an issue. There's almost 1,500 interactive grid squares, and this is a map specifically about heating, about the number of plus 30 days. And so we can see the country getting hotter. One of the communities that I've just visited is a hot spot already within Canada, really. It's actually the hottest weather I've ever felt, 42 plus degrees in the interior BC. I was just shocked that they already are dealing with that type of weather. There's a modulating effect of the ocean, but inside these valleys and inside these kind of contours of the mountainous landscape of BC, there's these microclimates, and we can see that they're going to increase in temperature. Is it possible to really narrow in on that region and see? So if we click on Kamloops as an example, the data from that, that point opens up on the atlas. And if you look at the number of plus 30 days, you know, on average in Kamloops in 1976 to 2005, it was on average about 25 plus 30 days, which is quite a few. It's a, it's a warm area in Kamloops. Mm -hmm. But if you look at that high carbon far future out in the 2051 to 2080 period, we're going to jump up by 36, 37 days on average. And so we're going to see, you know, more than a doubling of plus 30 days. It's an interesting indicator of like, what, what do you expect life to be like in the future when that becomes the normal? I side? really like the idea of stories being the central feature for the Climate Atlas because it makes it about being a story in our own lives as opposed to just a story of there like a political issue I and mean, actually how it affects us in our daily lives. We need to figure out how to create communities that are designed to buffer and in some ways benefit from the changes that are likely to come because the changes are going to be sweeping, they're going to be serious, and those communities that are ready for that, they're going to know where their water is coming from and ensure that it's protected. Thank you, Hector. I'm going to switch back to the um, slide here. So, um, view, present. 
Yeah, so I, I just wanted to show Power to the People because I think it's it's a good resource that's out there, kind of the, one of the first of its kinds of a TV show that does show climate solutions. I think a lot of times when we think about climate change, a lot of people, why people um, disengage is because they feel so overwhelmed because it's a global planetary issue that a lot of us don't feel prepared for. And I mean, as you can see what's with happening here um, with all of the flooding and all of the fires, we are definitely not prepared. And so I think it's really important to kind of uplift the stories of communities that are getting prepared um, because I think a lot of our communities, you know, even at the university or even surrounding communities aren't necessarily prepared. Uh, I know, you know, back home, we're not always prepared. So I think it's, it's great to kind of see and uplift communities that are already doing this work um, to become prepared. Yeah, so um, next year we'll be releasing a, no, not in 2022 actually now, a Just Transition Guide. Um, but to close, I do want to go through a number of climate policy implementation and recommendations um, for this presentation. Um, you know, because obviously we want to uplift um, uplift the rights of Indigenous peoples and, you know, work in partnership with Indigenous peoples. So to answer the question above of a just recovery, what does that mean? A just recovery must uphold Indigenous rights um, and include the full and effective participation of Indigenous peoples and, in, you know, also include free prior and informed consent, which we don't necessarily see happening here in so-called Canada. Um, so I don't want. I wanted to direct folks to if you haven't read already, I would definitely recommend um, looking up uh, the decolonizing climate policy in Canada that was put out um, earlier this year by Indigenous Climate Action. I will read a couple of things that come from there, but I definitely um, encourage folks to read that. Indigenous peoples, our rights, our knowledges, and our approaches to climate change are systemically, systematically excluded from the creation and implementation of climate policies and plans. To, adic to adequately address climate change policies and solutions and need to take aim at the ongoing drivers and root causes of the crisis and need to be centering the voices, needs, and leadership of the people that are most impacted by this crisis. Um, I like this quote as well of um, Tom Goldtooth um, from the Indigenous Environmental Network, somebody that's been doing this work for close to 40 years, um, has argued carbon trading offsets and other market-based systems turn the sacredness of our mother's carbon cycling capacity into property to be bought and sold in a global market. Carbon trading will not contribute to achieving product, um, protection of the Earth's climate. It is a false solution with many risks, including the dangers of entren entrenching and magnifying social inequities and human rights abuses. From the Indigenous mindset, it is a violation of the sacred, plain and simple. So, you know, and we, so we see Indigenous people saying this, but we also see climate scientists saying this. Um, that net zero has been co-opted and that climate scientists are warning against the, um, this was taken from a UK climate scientist concept, the, of the concept of net zero being a dangerous tra trap um, and warning that current net zero policies will not keep warning, warming to 1.5 because they were never intended to, that they were and still are driven by a need to protect business as usual, not the climate. Um, so when private scientists expressed significant skepticism around the Paris Agreement, um, BECCS offsetting geoengineering and net zero, apart from some notable exceptions in public, we, this is a quote from the article, in, in public we quite, quietly go about our work, apply for funding, publish papers in tech, the path to dangerous climate change is paved with feasibility studies and impact assessments. So I definitely just look up, if you want to read more on this, um, look up this title at the bottom, which is just a screenshot from it, um, sci climate scientist concept of and net zero is a dangerous trap. It's a really good article. Um, some more things to think about when implementing climate policy at UVic and anywhere is to meaningfully integrate Indigenous knowledge. Um, that Indigenous knowledge needs to exist within all faculties, departments, and areas of studies and not be relegated to just certain areas, which we have definitely seen in the past in academic spaces. Um, so also, you know, um, the, in 2014, the IPCC stated that Indigenous knowledge systems are a major resource for adapting to climate change, but that these have not been used consistently in adapting, in, in existing adaptation efforts. And experts say that, that such systems have not been widely integrated into climate strategies developed by provincial and or federal governments. So this is what we're seeing across the board. Um, a lot of lip service to indigenous knowledge, but not the implementation and kind of integration of the knowledge. 
Um, one thing that I wanted to mention that I think is always great for academics and scholars, and I'm sure many people know about this on this this call in this presentation of the two-eyed seeing that was um, an Enigma elder um, conceptualized and shared with the world of um, two-eyed seeing, saying that it refers to learning and seeing from one eye with the strengths of Indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing, and the other eye with the strengths of Western knowledges and ways of knowing, and for the, un the learner to use both eyes together for the benefit of all. And that was by Elder Albert um, from the Mi'kmaq Nation. So Indigenous knowledges um, can help ma manage the climate crisis. Um, knowledge systems, so it's important to recognize the contributions Indigenous peoples have already made in the battle against climate change, says Deborah McGregor, who is the chair, research, Canadian Research Chair in Indigenous Environmental Justice. One of the, you know, and, and many of us have heard how, about how um, Indigenous peoples, you know, are uh, two to four percent of the world's, up to six percent of the world's population, but we actually present, um, protect 80 percent of the world's biodiversity. Um, so it is obvious that this knowledge is maintaining ecological integrity, um, McGregor says. So I think it's important to acknowledge this, that it's just not, you know, something nice to um, to utilize and say that we've integrated this, but it's actually literally um, protecting and saving um, areas across the world. Um, so I also liked the quote that McGregor says of that you that you have to work with indigenous peoples, not just with our knowledge. And switch to the next one. Sorry, this is so finicky. Um, also, stop paying perpetuating extractivism. I think a lot of times when we think of extractivism, we think of just extractivism, extractivism around um, you know land um, extractivism with oil and gas and fracking and logging and all the things that I you know quickly talked about today. But also the extractivism that occurs you know um, of our knowledges, our minds, and our bodies, our times and in spaces. So um, in academic spaces, you know I've talked to many different scholars around indigenous ideas are often extracted once again um, without working with the people of the lands. Um, so we need to include Indigenous peoples, Indigenous researchers, Indigenous community members, and Indigenous communities across the board as a whole into the climate policy that UVic is looking to create. Um, and also I'll talk a little bit more about the divestment um, for divesting um, from the endowments from fossil fuel resource extractions that are actually also destroying Indigenous homelands. Um, so I think that is an important thing to talk to, you know, understand that relationships of indigenous knowledges are drawn from relationships that can't be severed from the places and peoples who actually hold them. Um, so we can't co-opt indigenous knowledge. Um, we need to actually um, really honor where it's coming from. Divestment as well. Um, you know, if you, if universities are committing committing to you know mitigate the climate crisis, that they also can be investing in significant amounts of funding fossil fuel ex, um, sectors. And we've seen, you know, much adv advocacy work by students and staff. Um, and so many universities are choosing to divest. Um, this wasn't a thing, you know, even 15 years ago, it was kind of like laughable. Um, but we are seeing this happen. Um, so UVic of what I've looked into has done some initial steps, but still has a, a way to go. Um, so it is important to ask, you know, where is our, what is our tuition funding? Who is making decisions on behalf? What are, what industries are they tied to? Um, and then from, uh, the University of Victoria researchers with the corporate mapping project, a partnership of universities and community-based researchers in investigating the power influence of oil and gas, um, in coal in Western Canada said that it is important to scrutinize um, those who oversee collective wealth, examining how their interests and ideologies hamper or enable energy transitions at universities in government and in wider society. You know, again, what I mentioned earlier today about is supporting Indigenous resistance, um, because, you know, ind again, Indigenous peoples are across the board being criminalized just for protecting the homelands, their own homelands, you know, that they have been stewards over for millennia. And, um, you know, we see, we saw 11 people at least this weekend um, arrested again in Wet'suwet'en territory. So I think it's really um, important to also understand that if you look at this this um, this really great report that came out from the Indigenous Environmental Network and the Oil and Oil Change International around Indigenous resistance against carbon, which you know has been is seen as effective, that twenty four percent equaling to one point five eight billion metric tons is equivalent to the pollution of four hundred 
new coal fired power plants um, that the that basically 24 percent um, has shown that the struggles have proven successful that indigenous resistance has stopped this equivalent of greenhouse gas emissions so I think it's pretty amazing you know sometimes I think people see on the news this is changing but you know I started campaigning and doing this work 15 years ago when it was just like we were just troublemakers and um, you know but instead I think more and more people are seeing that indigenous peoples using their bodies and literally putting their bodies on the line is 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 been is is not just a benefit for the community that they from the, that they come from but also uh, the community and society as a whole um, and that we need to ensure that Indigenous perspectives are not systemically um, excluded. Colonial academic institutions were not created by us or for us, and thus the structures within them need to be shifted to respect and integrate other worldviews and Indigenous worldview. And so I think it's really important to ask how can relationships be re reciprocal and genuinely beneficial everyone, for everybody. Um, and I think that's really important. And I think, you know, take taking note of how Indigenous peoples um, have been extracted, extracted, but then also excluded. Um, and that's what we uh, was studied in the Indigenous Climate Actions Decolonizing Climate Policy, um, where Indigenous peoples' perspectives, um, that one way to ensure that to not exclude Indigenous perspectives is to ensure that the timelines um, that we need to, in, to bring about um, community community involvement and community, community perspectives are heard and incorporated and um, into climate policy that there's enough timeline for that because a lot of times it's too quick and and it's just it's done in such a manner that it does not actually incorporate um, our perspectives in a in a robust or a comprehensive way and this is what happened for the pan-canadian framework um, uh, for climate change and as well as the he he as they call it the healthy environment uh, and healthy economy that was done by the federal government some resources I um, just wanted to point to before I'm closing up here is, you know, obviously Power to the People, the Climate Atlas that we showed in Power to the People, which is an amazing resource that allows people to be able to click on stories and learn more about the how Canada is warming um, and learn more about that and also ICA. Um, when, and I wanted to end with this idea and concept of healing justice um, and how um, you know, how do we decolonize academic spaces? And this is a part of, you know, making safer spaces for Indigenous peoples that we need university campuses to be safer and more accountable to Indigenous students and the communities that they belong to. Because, um, you know, everything is very individualized in um, Western society and we need to also name collective processes that help transform and heal all the spaces and places in which we have to walk into because it's not, not an easy place to be in as an Indigenous person that comes from a small community to go into these places. Myself, in my first degree, I was one out of a thousand out of 30,000 students that was Indigenous for my first degree at the U of A and it was very, very challenging. Um, so I'm just talking about how, about how we need to bring about collective healing and um, if you haven't read this book, I would definitely um, encourage about decolonizing wealth. And, you know, university places are extremely um, places of wealth and places that um, there's been accumulation of wealth. Um, so everybody ha and the, the writer, um, Edgar Villan Villanueva, talks about everyone having a responsibility in making things right. Everyone has a role in the process of healing, Re regardless of whether they have caused or received more harm, all our suffering is mutual and all our healing is mutual and all our thriving is mutual. Um, that all my relations, that word means that everyone and everything is interdependent and interconnected. So the future for me um, on the UVic campus as well as anywhere that we go into community um, looks like self-determination, energy so sovereignty, and healing the land and healing ourselves, relearning our sacred connection and responsibility to Mother Earth, healing the trauma of white supremacy on all bodies so that we do not perpetuate that trauma on others, um, you know, increasing the value um, we need to see on the lives of Indigenous women and two-spirited people, and ultimately understanding that our self-liberation is tied to collective liberation and that it is time for truth-telling in the era of the TRC and now that we have the TRC day that we need to really decolonize um, our minds and that is a part of the beginning of the truth-telling. Um, so that's how I'm going to end today. Um, hi, hi. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm going to take it off screen share. Um, thank you so much. Hello, Melina, for such an excellent talk.
today. And um, if you're good with it, I wanted to open it up to some questions maybe that people might have. Sure. All right. So if you, uh, if you either want to raise your hand or put it in the chat, um, we have some time for questions. So I think I see Matilda. Yeah. Hi, Melina. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering if you have any resources in terms of environmental races. I have a big interest in this approach, but I haven't found many resources um, specifically for like planetary health, environmental psychology and environmental races. And my interest is also because uh, recently the Canadian government um, had a bill proposed in the parliament but it didn't go through. And for me, this was an excitement moment, but unfortunately, unfortunately it didn't go through. And the reason is because also uh, it comes with an intersectional uh, lens. So it's not only taking into account indigenous populations, but also uh, black uh, or other marginalized communities. Um, so yeah, just in case you have any comments on environmental races and resources, thank you. Yeah, I feel like um, if you're looking for, yeah, somebody just put in the chat of, um, oh yeah, here I see that you just put that in there around environmental racism. I feel like um, there's a lot of great resources um, out of the states with environment around environmental racism um, that was developed in the 1990s. Um, and then there's the environmental um I, I'd have to send it to you. I could I could do a bit of research, but um, there is there is some good resources that are, it exists through the Indigenous Environmental Network and also CJA, the Climate Justice Alliance. Um, so yeah, I will I'll send you some more resources, and I'll just grab your um, Jess if you Jess if you're still on here, can you grab that email for me? Perfect. Uh, I see a, another question from Georgina uh, that's in the chat. Hey, Georgina. Uh, how long was the project with you to build the solar panel? Uh, to build the solar panel? So how, how long did that process take for you? And I know from working with you on this, this is an extensive undertaking. Yeah, so we there was there wasn't um, nor did I want to because of just the the tension that exists a lot of times between, unfortunately, the Alberta government and the um, indigenous, and indigenous communities in Alberta, um, there was there wasn't funding at the time, um, and so we actually had to fundraise to even be able to build the project. So that the fundraising actually took longer than the actual building of the project. So just with the fundraising took about a year. And then um, from there, once we had enough um, resources in place, then we went to, then we started just hiring and we had to actually put in um, a single line diagram through the microgen application of through the Alberta um, regulators to be able to even connect to grid um, so that, you know, just getting approval to be able to connect to grid. If you're doing an off-grid system, it's a lot easier because you don't have to go through connecting to the grid, which is a bit more challenging and just a bit more um, time time consuming. So once we had the approval to be able to connect to the grid, um, then we started building and it actually didn't take that long. It was just kind of making sure that everything was in place. The the panels because we were in a such because we are in such a remote area it took a while for the panels to even be delivered so we had to go through different distributors because one of the the import companies that was like bringing them in said we couldn't even find your reserve on on google maps so we had to switch over to a local so they brought it from one place to another place to another place so it was just um it was kind of time consuming more like the preparation and planning but once everything and all the gear and all the people were on site it literally took two weeks so it was like it was a really quick turnaround and also um just a lot of people kind of banded together and helped be able to like grill uh, to drill and like auger and to like you know um also had a friend develop the top of pull mount system so we had a top of pull mount system so it was it was just a little bit of a different um, exercise it wasn't um, as typical um, but we wanted to put it above um, away from people being able to 
kids being able to climb it and slide down it um, because they definitely look like slides when they're slanted. So we had to put them pretty high up to ensure that it was safe for the community and that the high voltage um, wasn't a concern um, and the accessibility of that. So yeah, it took, so it just depends on the planning phase as always, I feel like takes longer. And then once you have everything in place, it was just like whoosh, two weeks. That's amazing work. Um, as, as a follow-up to that, I know a lot of it was about empowering youth in your community. How have you, what impact is, have you seen on the youth as, um, as that project took hold? Well, I think it's just that people, the young people started to see that there was different ways of producing energy. Cause I think people, you know, just like anybody, just like any community, they don't, you know, we turn on the, we flick on the light switch and we don't think about where it comes from. So I think it just kind of got, um, the juices flowing around that, you know, cause when I went in to do the, um, the, the liter the energy literacy workshops, they, the youth were like, you could tell it's so a grade five, even grade five was just like, I was like, okay, so does anybody have any questions about the solar panels that they see outside? And they're just like, oh, everyone shot their hands up. They're like, just see what happens when the sun doesn't shine. Like they were thinking about this. And like, you know, I think if, when we don't have projects like this, when we don't have lessons or things that are tangible, um, it just seems like a far away thing. And so I think that was the exciting thing about bringing it to the community and saying like, we can do this too. And again, with environmental justice and climate justice and just transition, the, the idea is for communities that have faced the brunt of environmental degradation, the communities that have faced the brunt of, um, you know, the contamination, the toxic burden that nobody seems to want to talk about and or climate change impacts, um, which are now slowly coming and, you know, affecting everybody um, in Canada, but have been, you know, creating havoc all across the, the world, um, that finally we can have some sort of autonomy in what energy sovereignty looks for us like how can we envision a new way and how can we transition um, out of the fossil fuel kind of entrenchment that we've been under for decades Excellent. Uh, i see another question here from lauren pang uh, thanks for your presentation melina in your experience what would you say are the biggest institutional barriers slash policy legal mechanisms facing communities that are pursuing renewable energy projects yeah, when we when we were um, going across, you know, coast to coast, it was for me the number one that seemed to be the biggest um, kind of barrier is was climate policy, um, because a lot of governments weren't adopting climate policy that was actually allowing for the transition. So it was definitely um, communities having to kind of fight for the ability to even connect to grid. Um, you know, so the policy was not on the side of the communities. It was on the side of, you know, fossil fuel industries and or utilities, you know, so it was, it definitely did not favor a lot of times in, because basically the, the kind of energy policy or the grids are under the jurisdiction of provinces. So it, it changes for each province. So, but even going to province to province to province, um, many times it didn't benefit. So there was, you know, there's the few that like the Green Energy Act, which was no longer exists in Ontario, that did usher in more renewable energy projects for Indigenous communities and non-Indigenous communities across the board. Um, but then that was done away with a new government. And the same thing happened with the Notley era where they were actually allowing for um, more um, uh, megawatts to go to the grid through renewable energy, and that's been done away with the Kenny government. So it, it's literally the politics of the day affect climate policy, and you know during a climate crisis, it shouldn't it shouldn't be that way. Um, they shouldn't be able to do away with these things that literally communities need to transition. And the same thing is happening here in so-called BC, where many communities that I've talked to, when we to do the small microgrids, not the mega dams, because mega dams, in my opinion, are not clean, and um, they reduce they put out so much methane and GHGs um, because they have so many reservoirs that are sitting with methane, but and and many other things that destroy um, farm land and indigenous communities homes but the microgrids the small pen stock which the micro hydro um, the run of the river systems that indigenous communities were able to kind of to start developing their own energy within their own communities those were also done away with because of the mega dams and prioritizing a one centralized system and a monopoly a monopolization of of energy and we need to see a decentralization of energy and that's that hasn't happened Excellent. Uh, the questions are starting to come in pretty quickly here, so I'll, I'll 
go to the next one uh, from Darlene Masso. Uh, why are there issues with geothermal heating? heating? And she used the example of colloquia. Yeah, so there's a difference between geo exchange and geothermal. Um, so geothermal is technically two kilometers down. So when you're going into to utilize geothermal. So geothermal hasn't technically really been utilized here in Canada. We what what they what communities are using right now is geo exchange, which is a very surface level kind of like loop a closed loop system. But with geo geothermal, it it goes down very deep into the Earth's core, and we don't know a lot of times what's being disturbed. If you're going kind of like oil and gas wells, this is the same kind of concept with geothermal. So that so that's why. With Tolokli, it, it they're not going very down into the Earth's core. So I so we just so we've definitely made had to make a distinction between what is geothermal and what is geo exchange. And geo exchange is a lot less invasive and isn't um, making the in immense impacts. Where geothermal, um, we don't have we don't have that still, and a lot of communities are very concerned about that. So with Tolokli, it um, it's actually more of a geo exchange um, closed loop system than um, geothermal because that is, that actually hasn't really been, um, bought, is not yet viable and not been commercially to scale yet here in Canada, like it has been in like places like Iceland and things. Excellent, yeah, what over for that. Uh, from Jessica Kent, uh, do you have any thoughts on how to pressure our provincial government to include indigenous peoples in our provincial climate action plans in a meaningful way? Oh my goodness. Um, but, uh, that's a, that's a Big question. We could extend that out to the university as well. Yeah, and I mean, I think I I would definitely. I'm I'm sorry that I just kind of flew through the, um, but there was many points within the presentation that do respond to this of like how to pressure the government. But I think um, what we did, what what ended up being somewhat effective is is trying to ensure that there is some sort of expert tables of indigenous peoples that are sitting on par with the provincial government that are actually um, bringing recommendations to it. And that's, that's similar to what happened. I actually sat on the Indigenous Electrical Technical Working Group um, when the Notley, you know, obviously I didn't agree with everything the Notley government was doing, but I sat with other Indigenous, quote, experts um, and other Indigenous peoples from Indigenous communities where we sat and we actually informed around the climate policy and action plans that the government at the, of the day was doing. Obviously that, again, has been done away with, but um, so I think there it, we need to ensure that we're uplifting Indigenous ways of knowing and being in Indigenous science and Indigenous um, climate adaptation plans. You know, we have so many, like I said, with Power to the People, there's so many communities and we literally only profile 26 locations. There's literally, if you go to Indigenous Clean Energy's website and the report and research that they've done, there's there's literally over 2,000 Indigenous communities that have renewable energy, eco-housing, food security projects across the board in so-called Canada. So I think, you know, there's so many communities doing this work. And, and it's just really sad because we, I feel like we just see all the bad news stories, but we don't see the good news stories of what communities are actually doing and to mitigate, mitigate climate change for their communities. So we really need to uplift these stories of, of communities that are up leading, leading the way, but then also push for ensuring that there's Indigenous experts that are also sitting like alongside these tables because otherwise again this this knowledge indigenous knowledge is not going to be properly um inadequately integrated into climate policy plans so that's such an important point too and so it, there's an indigenous clean energy website is that right mm -hmm. or kind of a site ECE. yeah okay yeah. and i sit on their, their national steering committee but yeah they have a great website with a lot of research as well. Perfect. So I should have mentioned them and see, there's, and that's another resource that I should have had in there. Excellent. Well, I'll see if I can find it and I'll put it in the chat. Um, Kern Crawford has a question. He said, you mentioned net zero being problematic. Can you expand a bit more on that? And re relatedly, how uh, you or communities you work with perceive of embodied emissions in PV panels, et cetera? Those two questions. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> I would definitely, I would, I mean, 
I'm not a climate scientist, but I would definitely read that article and thoroughly um, the one that, that the climate scientists are talking about um, net zero emissions. But from an Indigenous perspective, if you want to read about climate scientists and why they find that problematic, I would read that article, which is, you know, net zero is a dangerous trap. So please do read that because it is a very long and it's not just like a news article. It's like a very in-depth um, research article. And then um, from an Indigenous perspective, the ways in which we see net zero as being problematic and co-opted is because it is basically commodifying the sacred, commodifying air, and using the same systems that have got us in through capitalism, the same systems of um, that have produced climate change, to use those same systems to somehow solve climate change. So that is a, a lot of the critique of, from an Indigenous perspective of why net zero is problematic, because it is, again, commodifying the sacred, commodifying air, and then also taking... So net zero, a lot of it, it is unproven. So net zero, so there's this idea that net zero somehow is like, you know, like everything in this modern society that technology is going to save us somehow. And, un, and all of these net zero technologies have not been proven yet. So they have carbon capture and storage, for example, which has been, you know, seen as somehow we're going to capture the carbon from the air and we're going to store it down and bury it into the earth for millennia and met, make future generations from for time immemorial to to basically to take care of our pollution because we don't want to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions that's essentially what CCS is and so net zero so net zero is saying we're going to utilize these technologies even though we have not um, brought them to scale, even though they 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 are somehow just this silver bullet, and we we still haven't. They're not proven. These technologies are still not proven. They're not actually capturing carbon right now and reducing it. There's a couple of places where they've utilized it around the world and have and like have literally failed. Um, and so you know, carbon is escaping. Um, animals are dying around these places. That's happened in Saskatchewan. Um, the Alberta government invested one billion dollars into this in two th around 2008, and it, in yet still no proven technology. We're talking about millions of dollars that is being, you know invested into this type of technology that that somehow allows us to keep polluting essentially is what the the issue with net zero is as opposed to just actually reducing our greenhouse gas emissions being good ancestors and not ensuring that future future um generations have to basically like similar to nuclear have to continue to take care of our our garbage and our pollution for time immemorial um so that's a little bit of if that makes sense but i do also encourage you to read net zero and around the embodied emissions of PV panels. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the question means, but I'm guessing um, around the, the front end of producing the panels. Is that correct? You might, you might have to, Kern. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Kern, maybe you can jump in real quick on your mic. Yeah, that's why I was just interested in, in your concept of net zero and any, anything, any engineered system we make has embodied emissions in it. Um, so just wondering what kind of how, how the communities you work with view that piece of it. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I think we are seeing these technologies like PV and solar and anything as transition technologies in that they do produce less GHG emissions. They do not have to have GHG emissions from the from the extraction through the production. They have it through the extraction and production, but they don't have it constantly when you have to burn up, you know, burn coal constantly or drive a vehicle constantly there's there's always emissions and being emitted from fossil fuels so there's inherently less ghg emissions with solar and pvs but that doesn't mean there isn't any so i think we need to not pretend and we can't like and i'm definitely not a cheerleader of saying like it's it's all about solar and solar is going to save us no like it is a it's a transition technology that we can utilize now and that should have actually been utilized from the 80s to be quite honest um and we're so late in the game um, but I think we need to be very, very honest about extractivism, even with renewable energy technologies like lithium mining. Um, so I think we can't pretend, we can't look away. We always have to be very clear of what we're talking about. And so that's actually what we, in our, in our Just Transition report that we were releasing next year through ICA and Sacred Earth Solar is, is to actually talk about those emissions and talk about Mining Watch Canada and talk about how there's still extractivism happening. So we still continue continually need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but also change our lifestyles. Like I said in the beginning, where uh, I would definitely encourage people to read the 1.5 Equitable Lifestyles Report because 
Canadians are the number one, like one of the number ones in the world. We have the highest GHG emission emitting lifestyles in the world through like heating, through food, through transportation, through all of the things. So we actually, it's not about blaming the individual because it's obviously it's it's an issue of the col- of the collective and also of corporations and complicit governments. Those are the ones that are actually producing the most, um, you know, the emitters and the polluters, but also us as people, we need to figure out how to work alongside that and try to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions because we are, you know, very high per capita dense GHG emitters in this um, country, in this part of the world. Excellent. Uh, what for that? I think um, lots of really good uh, kind of people expressing their thanks for the good work that you're doing and the resources you provided. Uh, I think we do have time for uh, one more question. I think Liz was just saying, yeah, Liz Bowman, just so you know, it is the indigenous clean energy dot com. And Jess also put that in there for. Oh, perfect. Yeah, it looks like. And Melina, as you know, we're, we're developing a uh, climate and sustainable action plan here at UVic. And one of the goals is to really center indigenous knowledge. Um, and you've given us a lot to think about. What are some, are, are there any kind of things that you think you would urge us to be cautious about or to, to consider as we're, as we're developing this plan so we don't fall into some of the pitfalls, pitfalls maybe of other plans? Yeah, I think it's, it's you know, obviously climate change is a crisis and we, we are running out of time because of the lack of action that's happened by um, previous generations. But I think also we need to, because Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous science has been, is just something that people are starting to realize other than Indigenous peoples, I would say, and our allies. Um, that is, it's very, it's something that does inform and does help and does create pathways forward that we do have solutions, but to be able to take the time to incorporate in a way that's respectful of those communities, um, to be able to make enough time and space to, for communities to share and feel like they are experiencing reciprocity, to not replicate extractivism of knowledge. Um, so I think it's just making sure that there's enough spaciousness for, for people to be able to engage in a way that feels respectful, meaningful, um, yeah, I think that's, it's always, it always seems like even with the climate justice work, you know, there's always these strategies being developed and it's like, give us your response immediately now. And it's just kind of, um, without kind of having that, like two eyed seeing in the way of just being able to understand that indigenous knowledge, especially a lot of it comes from our elders and our elders don't talk as fast as I do and nor that should they, because <laughs> I've had to learn how to talk way too fast as a climate and environmental justice campaigner. And um, I think that we need to ha- allow for some more spaciousness and allow for actually, um, you know, allowing our autonomic nervous systems to kind of come down in a lot of, you know, I think a lot of about what I've heard elders say in this era, in this time, because of prophecy about how when the world speeds up, we actually need to slow down. And so we need to actually be a lot more reflective and introspective as opposed to like ah, responding. And and I think it's a lot easier said than done, but that's just something that I've been learning the hard way um, to have to do. So I would just say that as, as well as hopefully all the other points that I mentioned that I didn't go through as thoroughly in the presentation, but I'd say could be referred back to. That's great. Thank you. Um, Time for one last question, if anyone has any thoughts or or even closing words. Thank you, everyone, for those kind comments. Appreciate it. Yeah, lots of good, lots of really good comments. I see from Sharon. Uh, sad to see the criminalization of peaceful protectors of the land. That's a really positive. Oh, okay. Here's one, maybe one final question here. 
from Selvi. Uh, if net zero isn't the solution, uh, what technologies would you suggest we adopt? Well, I think it's it's not just about technologies. It's about um, returning to more sustainable ways of being within our own lives and within the ways in which our community engage with Mother Earth. Um, you know, I think I think of say what happened this week um, in the Kwangan territory where people couldn't fill up their gas tanks. Um, which means not only can people not fill up their gas tanks, but that means that food is not coming, you know, we, we could go into like a food crisis and shortage. Um, so I think a lot about with climate change, are we prepared as individuals, families, communities? Um, what are collective care processes? I think it's, it's literally about not just depending on technologies, but also putting into place ways in which we become more climate resilient with, collective care, even with what we saw um, with COVID, with mutual aid, if we want to call it that. So how do we, like for me, one big challenge I've had to myself is like my previous place, I was able to finally learn how to garden. Um, but just simple things like that of ways in which we can become more, we can adapt our lives right now um, and be and figure out if it's something we have to do individually or something we can do as a collective um, in our families or in our wider communities of how we can become more climate resilient. Because I think when crises happen, we're, we might, we may or may not be able to turn, depend on other people. Right. And so I think when we, we really, we need, we need to learn how to develop, um, climate mitigation strategies within our own lives. Um, and I think no one talks about that. They think we don't talk about it. A lot of talk, a lot of us talk about it, but we're, a lot of us aren't prepared. Um, so I think we need to look at not just what technologies can save us, but also what um, we can do in our own lives to become more resilient um, in the face of climate, a climate crisis that could inevitably come again. Excellent. Um, uh, so I do see one more question, if you're good with that. We'll, we'll make this the last question from Stacey O'Sullivan. Uh, what are Indigenous perspectives on resilience or adaptation and what do you think uh, government decision makers could learn from that? Um, I mean, seeing, seeing, so a lot of what I've heard from elders is this like 500 year plan, you know, and, and unfortunately with current governments and decision makers, they have a very short term plan. And I think that's not proving effective that we need leadership in that has a longer term um, end goal, that it's not just about election strategies. It's not just about electoral politics, that we really need to have leaders that are indigenous and non-indigenous for say municipality or provincial or federal that have long-term climate strategies that it's not about our lifetime. It's about like literally 500 years. And so I think that's the difference between indigenous perspectives and non-indigenous perspective is that it's this short individualized timeline about a politician and their climate or their their political strategy to be reelected or to be seen as doing something really great that might not be really great long term versus the indigenous perspective which is a long term strategy of 500 years of like literally planting this tree or not uprooting this tree or anything around um extractivism or planning for 500 years ahead and that's and for me that's that's the biggest difference between an indigenous perspective on what I think uh, decision makers and governments could learn from. Excellent. Well, I think on that note, we'll close. Uh, Wado, so much, Melina, for your, your thoughtful and, and amazing presentation today and for all the work that you're doing. And you have lots of new fans in the chat. So uh, we'll, we'll send you some of the, the chat in case we didn't get to some of the questions. Appreciate everyone who submitted uh, questions questions and comments uh, but th join me in oh sorry i forgot to mention really quick too jeff i always do this but if people want to watch power to the people you can li literally stream it online under lumi on abtn it's oh, perfect broadcast. if you have tv you can watch it for free on tv and for lumi they have an online streaming service through abtn where you can access all indigenous media um through APTN and that's, I think it's like four ninety nine a month. So that's where you can stream it and get a better quality than what, what we just zoomed at you today. I would say it's like shot in 4K. So definitely 
tune into that if you want to learn more about what amazing Indigenous communities are doing across Turtle Island. Check Sorry. out Power to the Sorry People. To you, no, not at all. Not at all. Check out Power to the People. Uh, any ways that people can follow your work? Maybe on... Yeah, on social um, media or social media, yeah. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, you can look up my name, Alina Lobokan Massimo, and you'll be able to find me on those three platforms. I'm not on TikTok. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm, I'm an ex millennial. So <laughs> I've been banned from TikTok by by the teenagers in our house. So yeah, it's it's not happening. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, join me in thanking Melina. I know normally you'd hear rapturous applause, but on Zoom, you'll see lots of appreciation and, and nodding. But uh, yes, thank you so much, Melina. This is wonderful. And um, and we will stay in touch for sure about the work that you're doing and, and yeah. uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. So, Wado, thank you. My name is...